The topic is ML Data Ops Data Centric Approach to Improve AI Efficiency. This session will discuss the importance of moving to a data centric approach and how that will enable businesses to make better decisions. The speaker is Sudeep George, Vice President of Engineering iMerit. As part of his current role, he develops uh, production ready frameworks for a data centric approach to machine learning. Chairing this uh, session is Prashant Sheshadri, Group Manager, AI Plus Data, Intuit. Prashant has close to 20 years of experience in handling multiple projects and teams in big data, ML, data science, along with project management. It's a pleasure to have you both here with us uh, and uh, over to you, Prashant. Uh, thanks, Justin, for the introduction. Uh, Sudeep, great to have you over here. Uh, let me quickly start about by asking as to why do we need data-centric AI? What are your thoughts on that? Sure. Great to be on this conversation with you, Prashant, and really excited to be at the NASCOM Experience AI Summit. Uh, so that's a great question to start off with, right? Why do we need data-centric AI? So I think data-centric AI is essentially an evolution of all the experiences that a lot of industry practitioners have gathered. This is not a new idea. It's been around in different forms. Uh, it was in the hands and minds of uh, a lot of experienced folks who were able to deploy successful AI systems. And slowly now it's propagating through the entire ecosystem. The biggest proponent of uh, data-centric AI uh, is Nat Andrew Nick, and he's been very vocal and uh, very clear about you know, the benefits of a data-centric AI approach. And I think uh, given my experiences, there are three main areas where data-centric uh, approach really uh, plays an important role and has the biggest impact when building AI systems. The first one being that it's it starts with a very real world centric approach. A data centric AI uh, model is all about collecting data that best represents the real world within which an AI system has to operate. Uh, it doesn't help if you have large amounts of data, if those data pieces don't really give the full coverage or all the experiences that an AI system has could encounter uh, aren't covered within that data. So within a data-centric AI approach, it's all about data quality and how that becomes the most important paradigm by which data is collected, data is uh, curated, and models are uh, trained and tuned to uh, be deployed. In the uh, autonomous vehicle domain, there's this concept of operational design domain where you define the domain within which the AI system has to operate. And accordingly, you start collecting uh, all the representative data and you build the appropriate models. And as you expand the domain, the data that you collect uh, increases, the complexity of real world scenarios that you need to cater to also increase. And that is where you know the data centric AI approach really uh, shows its strength because it's all about mimicking how the AI system is going to uh, behave in a real world deployment. The second pragmatic uh, aspect of data centric AI is all about uh, the cost and time involved in collecting data. Data collection is a pretty expensive uh, proposition. I work in, uh, with companies in autonomous vehicles, autonomous mobility domains, or even medical imaging uh, domains where collecting data runs into a gamut of issues. One is the cost to collecting the data, the time required to collecting this data, and also the privacy and other aspects around the data that's being collected. And as in as this data collection process uh, kicks in, it is also an inherently noisy process where there's a lot of bad data that's getting collected and you need to start cleaning that up. So just collecting quantity of data doesn't really help. It is the quality of data. And by focusing on the data that matters, you're able to quickly iterate over these models uh, within, you know, and have perhaps a cost-effective approach to building a model. And the third and the last, I wouldn't say the last, but the one of the other aspects of a data-centric approach is that it mimics the real world in how the real world keeps changing. Uh, data drift is a concept that we talk about in uh, ML systems and data centric AI is able to cater to the uh, drift that occurs in data. Like for example, uh, most of the face detection uh, models that were created 
probably failed when COVID kicked in and people started wearing masks, right? Uh, so how do you start catering to that? You collect more data. Uh, you collect specific data that caters to those use cases. These are some aspects of, uh, you, you know, building an AI system uh, that showcase why a data-centric approach really helps. Thank you so much, Sudeep. Uh, wonderfully articulated. I mean, uh, for me, it's all about having a, you know, a very clean data. I mean, big, the biggest problem that we are facing today in the industry is having clean or accurately processed data, which is very essential for any of the AI systems. Uh, it can be harnessed for to provide business intelligence that can lead to smarter business decisions, uh, efficient operations, happier customers, happier or higher profits and growth. Uh, this offers a competitive advantage to any AI model, right? Like any bad data has severe effects on everything that from a customer service to a compliance to marketing or even revenue. You know, I would characterize as five qualities of, uh, you know, data. One is validity, uh, accuracy, completeness, consistency, and uniformity. Uh, keeping data clean includes standardization of data ingestion process, validation, uh, data accuracy, and monitoring these errors. Uh, for good performance of models, we need to ensure that data is high quality, accurate, and current, which is also real time. As we'll know, we all know that, you know, garbage in is garbage out. No matter how much time we spend in optimizing the models or trying to improve the model, but without good quality data, we'll always run into model performance issues. Uh, coming to the next topic, uh, uh, which is very interesting for me, is that evolution of uh, data ops. And how is it evolving? Uh, what are your thoughts around that, uh, Sudhi? So um, what I have been seeing over the last few years is that there are a lot of companies who are releasing AI systems, right? Whether it's in the consumer space, medical imaging space, and obviously uh, domains like autonomous vehicles and autonomous mobility also see, are seeing a lot of real-world deployments. Um, I also see a lot of failures, right? These AI systems that are being released aren't really always meeting their performance metrics, right? And uh, what happens is there's this continuous process of figuring out, hey, why did this particular thing uh, not behave the way it should have? And then going back to the drawing board in certain cases. And this has allowed data ops and to come to, the, uh, come to prominence, wherein it is no longer just a series of best practices, but it's essentially a systemic uh, tool and process-driven uh, engineering paradigm, right? Uh, it is all about an engineering methodology methodology that is around data collection, data curation, uh, data classification, and continuous data monitoring. Um, I had talked about Andrew Nick earlier, and uh, you know his definition is uh, engineering the data that is used to build an AI system, right? And I, I think that kind of encapsulates all that is happening around uh, ML data ops, instead of just being a series of best practices and, you know, practitioner methods, you have uh, established processes, established tools, both open source and, uh, custom, I mean, proprietary tools that are now being deployed to make sure that uh, models are being trained the right way, models are being monitored the right way, and also ensuring that this is a continuous process, continuous training is now a paradigm uh, that makes sense once uh, models are being uh, deployed um, and inference is really live, right? Because things are changing, there could be model drift, there could be data drift, and monitoring the uh, entire system and uh, making sure it's up to date with the changes that occur uh, in its operating space. I think uh, all of that is uh, coming together and it's being formalized. And that's how I see data ops uh, also uh, evolving. I also see um, a bigger role for domain expertise. Uh, we started off earlier with, you know, let's take a generic model and apply it in, you know, any particular industrial uh, or uh, commercial domain, right? That no longer uh, always holds good. Uh, you have baseline models that you can use, but understanding the domain within which a model has to operate, understanding the specifics of the domain, understanding the data uh, that uh, exists within that domain is now becoming uh, equally important. And that is where I see a lot of domain-driven expertise coming into play. Uh, I talked about uh, monitoring tools, a bunch of tools, right? 
from uh, feature servers to uh, model quality tools to explainable AI, a uh, uh, lot of tools that help practitioners understand how exactly their model performed and why did their model fail for a particular scenario and use those lessons uh, as part of a continuous process to, con to keep updating their models. Within the domain that I operate in, I'm also seeing the way data is being classified is uh, undergoing a big change, right? Uh, now people understand, and we've had this experience that we have drawn from the various customers that we have worked with, uh, but now we are also seeing our customers uh, acknowledging and understanding the importance of some of these best practices around uh, annotation of data and classification of data, wherein they're talking about uh, consistency in labeling. If, if you are going to label an object as a cat, you have to make sure that every cat is labeled as a cat, right? Having an error where somebody uh, labeled as a dog is going to have a repercussion somewhere down the line. It'll be very hard to trace it. So having the consistency in uh, annotation, uh, making sure that there are clear guidelines that are coming from uh, the companies about how they want their data annotated. Uh, for example, they, um, companies in the medical imaging space know exactly what they want to achieve with the data, and they have to come up with those guidelines that cover all cases. It is no longer about, you know, let's just cover 50% and the remaining 50% we can see at a later point. It's all about being uh, making this a process of making sure that the guidelines are updated and also cover the entire gamut of data that is supposed to be uh, classified. So these are some of the uh, ways in which data ops has evolved. I see that now with the uh, uh, emphasis on explainable AI uh, and understanding AI in general is going to be another uh, evolution that is going to come in where we're going to be able to debug both the models and data uh, to a better level so that we can really understand uh, how the model performance is supposed to be for a particular scenario and why it failed in a specific scenario. Thank you, Sudip. Uh, adding on to what you just start, I mean, what you just spoke about, uh, you know, I think for me, the data operations has evolved from a while back to what it is now, right? Early early days, we just used to happen, we just used to have data pipelines generally migrating from data from OLTP to OLAC. And these processing were pretty straightforward, and you could just do it with a couple of ETL scripts and validation on top of it. And the size of data also used to be pretty small. But over the years, the data has really grown exponentially, and technologies like big data have emerged, where we have massive data sets flowing through the system. Uh, data ops is an organization's ability to fulfill or understand the health of the data in their systems. It reduces frequent and uh, sorry, uh, it reduces frequency and impact of data downtime by monitoring, alerting teams to incidents that may or may not go unnoticed for days, weeks, or even months. Like data ops, like uh, like DevOps, have its own set of pillars. Like, you know, what is the pressure of data? What is the distribution of data? Uh, what is the acceptable ranges within those distributions? What is the volume of data? Has all the data arrived? Uh, is there schema change during that transition of one hop to another hop? And what is the lineage? Lineage is the most important, especially for any kind of a machine learning algorithm that you want to build. If there are business logic that is built and you have a derived attribute, you need, really need to understand how that derived attribute has come about so that you can add it as a feature for any of your ML systems. So in simple, from a simple ETL uh, process that we had today, you bring in uh, explainable AI and self-learning AI, uh, which is the crux of all the data operations, right? Uh, without explainable, we can't just tell you, okay, Sudeep is going to buy a Tesla tomorrow, <laughs> right? Uh, we have to also explain as to why Sudeep is going to buy a Tesla. What is the rational or what's the model behind it uh, that's actually indicating that Sudeep is going to buy Tesla? Uh, so very interesting uh, terms in terms of, uh, uh, you know, data ops. But, you know, a follow-up question that I had is that now we have data ops, then we have ML ops. Uh, and, you know, what's the difference between data ops and ML ops? Uh, your thoughts, Sudeep? So I think ML ops and uh, data ops are, you know, they work hand in hand. Uh, they basically focus on two different aspects of building an AI system. Uh, for me, an AI system is uh, code, which uh, stands for algorithms and data, right? So you have code and data. 
And ML Ops uh, typically focuses on the code part, which is all about creating and uh, developing training models, and then uh, testing those models, uh, tuning those models, uh, serving the models, and also monitoring the model performance. But ML Data Ops is it goes back to one of the biggest areas where uh, companies spend time while creating an AI system. And that is in the data domain, right? So it starts off with data set collection. You need to know which is the data that you want to collect, how you're going to go about collecting it. Then you go through this whole annotation and classification process, after which you then start curating the data. Uh, you want to filter out uh, anomalies. You want to filter out bad data. You then spend a lot of effort around that. And then you use this data to you know, kind of make sure that the models are trained and tested appropriately. And once they are uh, you know, served, uh, you then start monitoring this data for drift. You keep understanding what is happening in the domain versus what your model is seeing in terms of data, and then kind of make sure that the data, the training data that is used across the entire ML process is, uh, or rather the ML pipeline is continuously up to date. Another important aspect that I feel uh, that ML data ops focuses on is about edge case handling. Um, edge cases are the you know are those scenarios that make or break AI, AI systems. And given that a lot of systems are now being deployed, focusing on edge cases is perhaps the number one priority for most of the companies who are in the production phase. Um, so they have sophisticated tools and mechanism mechanisms to uh, monitor and uh, detect these edge cases. Um, in most uh, scenarios, the edge cases a factor of the data that was used to train the AI system. And so that comes back to how this data is being classified. Did you have enough coverage? Did you have a particular scenario that you didn't really collect data for? Can you use synthetic data? Can you use data augmentation techniques? All of these slowly start uh, adding up, right? And um, I, I think it's a sign of the maturity uh, within this whole uh, AI domain that we now have this a plethora of tools and processes that we can use to improve both the model and the data. And that, you know, is a great sign of the progress that has been made in the space. Yeah. Uh, so, Sudeep, can you highlight how a real-world problem can be eased with uh, data solutions that uh, you have experience in building? Sure. So, data today comes from multiple sources. And in many cases, you don't even know where the data was collected from. I would you know, start off with an example from public data sets. So ImageNet is a very popular uh, data set that is used in computer vision, um, used across a lot of industries, a lot of uh, AI models have been built on top of it. And uh, I think about a year back, there was a very interesting study done by a research lab, which is now commercializing that solution, uh, where they actually analyzed the data that makes up the ImageNet data set. ImageNet data set is about uh, 14 million images, right? And they found that 5% of that data set is wrongly classified, wrongly annotated. So you had uh, frogs being classified as pots, uh, dogs being classified as something else, and a lot more crazier examples, right? Um, so that's one uh, example where, uh, you know, you, it kind of highlights the importance of being sure of the data that you're working on, because in many cases, nobody has the bandwidth or the wherewithal to actually go and check 14 million images and make sure that all of that data is really good. So uh, one example where ML data ops is slowly uh, playing a role is kind of giving insights into many of these publicly available data sets. The same example actually holds good for MNIST, which is a data set that is used for uh, we, you know, interpreting uh, numerals. And uh, again, there were a lot of errors that were found there. Um, so I, I would just like to highlight that it's very important to be sure of the data that you're using. And to kind of build upon some of these examples, I'll take, the, I'll take another example from the medical imaging space where uh, data was collected and it was being analyzed and it was basically for some uh, cancer research. And so a lot of these tumor cells were being uh, uh, collected and uh, digitized and being used to train the models. And what happened is um, they had initial success. And after some time, uh, 
you know, they just flat out, right? So the model wasn't able to keep up. And as it got exposed to a lot more use cases, it actually, the performance actually started dipping considerably. So they were actually failing uh, a lot more than anticipated. And when they went back and they actually uh, started debugging the model, which itself is a painful process, but then finally they reached this point where they started looking at the data. And what they saw was that the images that were used to train the model, uh, since these were tumor cells and it was important to understand the size of the cell, the images had a graduated scale uh, at the side of the uh, image, right? So there was a scale which was used for measuring the size of the uh, cell. And that was actually being taken as a signal, as a feature by the model. And the model was actually looking at that scale and saying, okay, if I see the scale, then that means there is an error, right? And it was then interpreting any image that gave the scale as uh, being classified as uh, something that needs to be investigated for. So one example of, you know, where bad data that can actually, uh, you know, impact the performance. And the example, uh, which is about trying to bring out the uh, signals and the features that exist within data so we had this customer who was uh, looking at uh, classifying road scenes as being uh, cloudy or uh, sunny, depending on you know how the uh, outside conditions were. If it was uh, rainy, then they would classify the classifier would uh, you know start labeling those images as taken under cloudy weather, and if it was sunny, it would all work. It would uh, be classified appropriately, and that worked well for a limited set of use cases. But again, once it was deployed in the real world, started failing, uh, went back, uh, couldn't really do much. They dumped a lot of data in this process in the, in the sense that they collected a lot of data to kind of improve the model, but didn't really meet the performance metrics. And then finally, uh, what we did was we looked at the length of the shadow by objects on the road, right? So if there's a car going in front of you, there's a shadow, then you use that as a feature. And if there's no shadow, you uh, appropriately derive, uh, a, you know, another interpretation. So using these signals, you were uh, able to uh, help the customer in making sure that they could uh, get the model to work. Um, and I think it's a great example to highlight why it is important to understand and study this data. Uh, we, are, we have also seen it in industrial imaging examples where uh, it's very hard to pick up all the anomalies and you know you could collect gigabits of data gigabytes of data rather and you still wouldn't uh, find out the anomaly but specifically uh, collecting data around the anomalies and training the model for it actually uh, you know improves the model performance drastically thank you so much sudeep uh, i will give you i might give another articulation which is not an image uh, i mean we use tons of uh, apps in our phones today right uh, one of the things that we have done exceptionally well is to identify customers who are churning from the product, right? It's a very simple solution. I mean, how do you identify customers who are going to churn in the next 30 days uh, from the product, which is a very important problem for, you know, all the product companies out there, right? Uh, so for this, we need to build uh, such a system where we need to understand the product usage data, clipstream data, external data such as you know macro and microeconomic conditions that might come from external sources customer personas a uh, business data set of customers and application errors right i mean these are some of the really valuable data sets that we'll have to collect uh, in order to do a correct kind prediction all these data needs to be available in real time from the products to the data lake from where we can make the right decisions these data sets need to be available so that the model can run in real time, identify customers who are at risk of churn, and have an interruption or a help from a customer success agent so that we can help them to prevent uh, churn or if they're facing some issues to prevent it. For all this, we need data ingestion, processing of data into features uh, from where the model can run its predictions, uh, the data sets of feedback which goes back into the model, and calculation of the success criteria, right? If you look at all of them, it's just data, data, data all over the place, right? And this is why we need clean data or accurate data to do the predictions for which we need real good data solutions out there in the market, uh, or at least in a system. Uh, with that, Sudeep, I will end this conversation. Uh, thank you so much for joining the summit. It was really a pleasure to uh, host you and a wonderful conversation between the two of us. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Sudeep and Prashant, for that uh, insightful session.